for joining us today. Uh, we have a special team program today with uh, Dr. Fazil Qureshi and Mr. Joe Ambrose, who have worked together for many years, treatment planning, challenging reconstruction cases, complex surgical guides, uh, all on four surgeries, Chrome Guided Smile, educational events, Fear Study Club, uh, the list goes on and on, really have worked together an awful lot in the past, uh, even in the past couple of decades. Uh, they will present uh, today together with a, pro uh, with a product introduction by Kevin Norman from Nobel, who's a longtime uh, implant product specialist. Uh, regarding Dr. Qureshi, uh, we, we as, a, as a dental lab here in, in Northeast Ohio are very fortunate to have such a, um, such a well-respected, I, I kind of chuckle, top of the food chain, uh, DDSMD, he's just wonderful. Uh, who we work with on, on all types of um, you know, surgeries. Um, and on a personal note, uh, when, when a team, when our team has a challenge or we need support, uh, Dr. Kreshi is always available. He's always insightful. Uh, he's really been a good friend of the laboratory and helped us uh, in a lot of different situations. Uh, may, maybe that's a disclaimer, Dr. Kreshi, I don't know, but we'll call it a disclaimer. Um, I'll, let me give you just a real quick bio because um, I don't have all 120 pages present, but uh, Dr. Koresh is a full uh, tenure professor with Case Western University and University Hospitals. He's a residency program director of the Department of OMS at Case Western University, and he's also a medical director of the Visage a Surgery Institute where he performs uh, both oral, facial, uh, implant, and cosmetic surgeries. Uh, he's a native of Toronto, Canada board certified OMS by the OBOMS and board certified by the ABCS <clears throat> and ABFCS. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of accreditations. Uh, uh, graduating dental school from Sunny Buffalo in 94, completed OMS residency at Case Western uh, in 97 with an integrated MD, which is a special program that Case Western has. Uh, then a one-year PGY general surgery training followed by a specialized fellowship in facial cosmetic surgery in 2000. Uh, and I understand he just paid his loans back in the year 2000. I'm just kidding. Just kidding about that part. Uh, so, okay, skipping the 127 pages of bio, his, uh, his lovely wife is an endodontist, Dr. Usman, which is nice to have, you know, in the family there. And then he has uh, just four awesome kids, and he has a great Instagram account. So follow him on Instagram. Our dual presenter is Mr. Joe Ambrose. Uh, he served at Rowe Dental Laboratory as a technical director since 1985. We purchased his lab all those years ago and worked with us ever since. Uh, he is our CDT guru. He's our go for for all things uh, dental technology and clinical. Uh, has LVI training, Dawson training, uh, many institutions throughout the country. He's on the uh, member of the American Prosthodontic Society, certified dental technician, and his, his bio kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, so those are our two presenters. Um, Kevin is going to do the quick opener um, of the product. And with that, I'll allow, uh, I'll, you know, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Norman. I'm a territory manager in Northeast Ohio for Nobel BioCare. Um, happy to be here. Thank you for joining this very timely presentation on Trefoil, which is a economic solution to mandibular full arch restoration. Um, and thank you, Dr. Qureshi, for joining, as well as Joe Ambrose. In the chat, if you would kindly put any questions that you have, we will address those questions at the end of the hour. Uh, so kindly uh, feel free to just enter those there. Let's see. Okay, so our objectives for today, understanding patient evaluation criteria for pre-treatment consultation understanding preoperative -op, pre prosthetic preparation, and then with the help of Joe Ambrose, understand the restorative trefoil treatment techniques. There's two categories when it comes to final restoration, and here you can see the differences between fixed removable and fixed. Overdentures made on freestanding implants are retained, but more important to note, they are soft tissue supported. So while the overdentures provide retention, there is still movement. On the right side, you can see the fixed solution. It's a mandibular restoration supported by five implants. It's entirely implant supported. 
So what seems pretty basic to us on the phone is not typically that basic to your patients. I will say working with Dr. Qureshi and the staff at Visage, they do an excellent job uh, presenting different options to patients so that these expectations can be met. We now have 50 year documentation on implants. More important, we have 50 year documentation on double arched fixed um, cases. So the first case was done in 1977 by P.I. Branamark. Um, actually, I take that back. It was in 1965. Um, by 1977, P.I. Branamark had already published a 10 year study. So we can feel pretty good about the success here. There's several studies published showing outcomes for all on four uh, developed with immediate loading. This Mallow study was published in the Journal of the American Dental Association in 2011. Implant dentistry that's pre-planned is one of the most predictable things that clinicians can offer to patients. The all on four solution is robust, but the trefoil solution that we're talking about today has a lot of cost advantages and patients can leave with a final restoration or get that final restoration right away. Before trefoil, there were four different treatment options, depending on the various degrees of mandible resorptions. The one on the left is not a trefoil candidate. On the right of the blue line, we see three different resorptions from moderate to severe or advanced resorption. In these situations, Overdentures can be offered. They're held in place with locators, splinted together with a bar. The more implants, the more stable, but it's still removable. Not to mention the patient has to have regular inconvenient reline appointments. The all on four treatment concept is an option for significant bone loss as well and provides a fixed dentition, which patients obviously prefer when it's available to them financially. So the question becomes, what is the in-between solution? The purpose of trefoil is to treat patients that aspire for fixed solution, but might not have the financial means for the more customized solution like the all on four. Trefoil also means a solution for patients looking for faster time to teeth. This slide here shows how we are currently treating patients that are edentulous or have failing dentition in the mandible. We know that when you move a patient from a removable option to a fixed option, not only is there increased in benefit, improved function, stability, and retention, there is also an increase in cost. And that gap in the middle represents a huge financial hurdle for many, many people. What allows us to, whoops. Okay. My slides are going out of order. Okay. What allows us to do, to shorten the treatment time is a pre-manufactured framework with a passive fit. Implants that support immediate loading and a straightforward prosthetic workflow that Joe will be talking about. The pre-manufactured bar, automatically designed for natural arch of the mandible, contains joints that adjust to compensate for horizontal, vertical, and angular deviation, plus or minus four degrees. This slide here talks about six hours for treatment from start to finish based off of an average of five clinical studies. Now I've been at these cases with Dr. Qureshi and his staff at Visage. His cases start about 7.30 in the morning and he's dismissing the patient by 10 a.m. Dr. Qureshi can talk a little bit more how he does that. Trefoil has a high success rate as well as a high patient satisfaction. The idea of three implants to support a full arch mandibular restoration is well documented. Here's a study that I like to show. 
This was done in 2017. 110 patients participated in the study. 40 patients had reached the one-year follow-up appointment. On a scale of zero to 10, patient satisfaction was 9.1. On the left side of the screen, you can see a bar clip removable overdenture. And on the right, an all on four. What's very obvious here is that the nerve is at the top of the ridge. With the removable, the patient is going to experience quite a bit of pain. The trefoil is that middle solution where implants will be taking the biting forces. So who invented or who was the inventor of trefoil? We're gonna see a video from Dr. Kenji Higuchi. Hopefully it is not too shaky. Dr. Higuchi is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. His practice is located in Spokane, Washington, and he's received many awards from the Academy of Osseointegration Integration and the Osseointegration Integration Foundation. Treffle is an opportunity to offer the choice of a high quality fixed implant therapy to a wider patient audience. A group of patients that for financial reasons or time reasons felt that a fixed bridge was out of reach. In an in vitro study performed by Dr. Matthias Carl using strain gauge testing, the Treffle framework proved to be comparable in passive fit to that of individualized head cam respiration and was far superior to a cast framework. And that's what Trefoil is. It's not intended as a replacement for any of the present solutions to a patient population that aspires to a fixed bridge, but for various reasons, believe it was not possible. So the best ways to construct high return on investment questions is to focus your patients on where they wanna go rather than where they have been. Here are some great questions. What is your vision for your smile? What are your aesthetic object objectives? What challenges will you need to solve to achieve these objectives? What fears, what outcomes are you looking for? And how would you like to see the problem resolved? I think those are great ROI type questions. And the last slide, before I turn it over to Dr. Koreshi, are just some additional considerations for your patient. Desire for fixed versus removable. Do you prefer one to two days versus four to six months, which is a typical all on four? Uh, history of pain while chewing. Do you have significant resorption and need to stabilize? And what is the commitment to hygiene? So I'm gonna turn the presentation now over to Dr. Fazal Koreshi to review the anatomical considerations. All right, perfect. Thank you, Kevin, for that uh, great introduction. And thank you, Alan, and, and everybody at Roe, Patrick, uh, Joe, for uh, allowing us to share a little bit of our experience with using trefoil. We were first introduced, I th you know, I th as Kevin said, maybe about three years ago when they first launched it at uh, Nobel's Global Symposium as an alternative and economic solution for a patient that uh, presents with complete mandibular dentalism and probably or possibly uh, an ill-fitting prosthetic. Now, a lot of our patients that we see nowadays um, come with teeth or they're at the terminal stage of their uh, dental prognoses. And so this is now fitting into our, um, our options for patients, as Kevin mentioned, that might require a more economic solution for a fixed uh, prosthetic. Um, I'll, talk a little, I'll show some cases uh, that I've had the uh, pleasure and experience of, of using trefoil with and you know, the sort of indications. Um, some of the anatomical uh, points of interest for the surgeons that are participating uh, or, and, and also the general dentist that need to be aware of what are the anatomical limitations of the trefoil. 
uh, from an inner arch space, we do need about 22 millimeters of height from the crest of the ridge to the, the, to the opposing arch. So in essence, you have this guide pin that we would use in the operation, in the surgery, that could measure for us the amount of bone reduction required. Now, in the case that Kevin showed of the extreme mandibular edentulism, uh, severe resorption, um, you may not have enough native bone to place the implants because the implants have to be a certain length in order to, for this trefoil to work. So there is a balance between uh, the amount of bone that we have to reduce, the amount of bone that remains, and the inner art space for all the components that you can see stacked uh, along with the implants that, uh, that sit on top of, of, the, of the ridge. And we'll go through some of the uh, nuances about that. Uh, again, 22 millimeters is required from the crest of the ridge to the opposing arch. You need about 5.5 millimeters of bar thickness, and the rest is all the prosthetic space uh, to create this hybrid solution. Anatomically, these are the requirements that the trefoil needs. So when you're looking at treatment planning with your cone beam CT scans, like I said, we need about 13 millimeters of native bone to be able to place at least 11 millimeters to 10 millimeter implants. These implants are considered one piece which a, with a transmucosal or transosseous component above the bone that's a, uh, a smooth color uh, surface. This is all one piece. And in terms of the spacing from the mental foramina, you need at least about you know, two millimeters as we know there's an anterior loop. And as the thickness of the bone, this platform C dimension, about seven millimeters of bone thickness. Now, if you have severe resorption or you have resorption, but it's knife edge, we know that when we plateau the bone, the bone does widen the more apical we go with that bone reduction. So you can accomplish the, um, the width dimension appropriately as you reduce the bone. So that's not really an, uh, an issue. What does play an issue is the mandibular configuration, the anatomical form of the mandible. And this trefoil bar is more U-shaped than V-shaped. So if you had a patient that was more V-shaped in their configuration, looking down occlusally, this may not be a solution for that individual. Why? Because the bar would extend laterally and would be almost wider than the, the opposing arch, essentially. So we have to look into the look at the anatomical boundaries, both in terms of width, dimensions, and height, but also the configuration of the, the native mandible that we're going to plan on. Now, there's various software that are available. Um, I know that uh, Ro uses uh, Blue Sky software. Uh, Nobel has their own software as well that has the trefoil uh, configuration already planned in the software, so you can just place it into the, into the, into the uh, and I'll show you uh, screenshots of the planning. Well, here's one right now that shows that trefoil bar already in place using the DTX Nobel software. And if I just ran this video, I'm not sure if it, uh, it just shows, uh, let's see if it, not really playing, but this is the, the DTX uh, inter interface and I'll, I'll have another, another uh, slide that shows the three dimensional movements on, this, on the screen. So again, what are the preoperative considerations? We, we talked about anatomical criteria just now. So preoperative prosthetic situations. When patients present to the office and a lot of the clinicians on, on this webinar know that the first question to ask the patient, do you want something removable or something fixed? If they come in with a removable, ill-fitting ill denture, then we know that you know, what we're, whatever we're going to replace for them with one implants or two implants or two implants rather versus something fixed and not removable, maybe the decision tree to discuss either trefoil or the all on four. The other point of concern is the material that the trefoil, uh, that the prosthetic sits on the trefoil. This to me, I, we were talking about this uh, aside prior, but the majority of the cases that I have done have all been in acrylic based uh, prosthetic. Now, doesn't mean that newer materials, nano ceramic materials, and I'll let Joe talk about those and uh, from, from the dental laboratory standpoint, a lot of research has not been done on other than acrylic prosthetics. So with that in mind, if, if a clinician said, well, I want to put zirconia on top of this trefoil bar, we don't have the research studies to tell you that that would be 100% successful. 
with regards to implant la lack of implant integration or or compromising the 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 restorative uh, compromising the implant in the bone with the amount of force on that so up until now that product of trepo oil being released in the market space it was uh, done over about five countries um, using an acrylic bar that could be delivered actually the same day if you had timed the surgery, the prosthetics, and then also the uh, processing of the denture that day in the afternoon, the patient could receive their final prosthetic the day of surgery. So there would not be a, a temporary prosthetic phase that we do with, as we do with the all in four. There's no four months of waiting period. There's no grafting that's being done. This is placement of implants, picking it up, placing the bar. Bar is already pre-made, prefabricated. There's no casting required. And then the um, just the only thing that needs to be done prior is what we what our restorative colleagues typically do for a complete denture setup. Um, wax rims, if or someone who's uh, edentulous, we get a vertical dimension of occlusion that's uh, established by the use of articulators. We mount the case, um, and so really, there's really maybe one or two pre-surgical appointments by the restorative team. This will get them to the lab. The lab will then create. Um, wax rooms that can be tried in the mouth at the time of the surgery to verify that the, the VDO is correct, that we, we want to make sure our midlines are correct, that there's no canting of the, of the occlusal plane that needs to be taken accounted for. So the trefoil, as we talked about, is a mandibular solution. It's not a maxillary solution for same day final delivery of a final prosthetic. Um, a lot of people ask me that, can we do this for the upper, but there is no uh, the upper has a, is a lot more variable, and obviously the bone density uh, is such that there are cons considerations where you don't want to really load immediately and have these uh, patients functioning. Unlike an all-on-four where we can have more of a spread, we do have to contend with other anatomical barriers like our sinuses and so forth. So these patients all have, if they either have, have been partially dentulous, they're a terminal dentition, which I'll show a couple cases, or they're long-standing uh, atrophic mandibles. Um, where, as Kevin did mention, that they do suffer from a neuralgia, neuropathy, because the loose-fitting dentures compressing on the mental foramina that tend to uh, be a little bit more coronal now because of their resorption. And so every time they bite and chew, there's movement of the, uh, the poor retentive denture on top of the nerves on the ridge. The relationship of the structures, and that's with the, the mounting, um, going back to the previous slide, we really want to make sure that, um, that we're placing these patients in a at least prosthetic uh, class one relationship. Now, obviously, the, you know, depending on if a patient comes in with a uh, edentulous maxilla as well, well, then you're going to need to restore the maxilla somehow with the, the removable complete upper denture um, or taking into account the class three, uh, pseudo class three. Uh, relationship because of the resorption of the maxilla compared to the mandible. So be aware of, uh, of, the, of, of the bite and the jaw relationship as well. So again, everything gets transferred from, um, from patient to articulator and then can be taken into the mouth. Oftentimes we've used some, um, you know, the old fashioned, uh, we call them archaic now because everything can be done now with guided surgery. And I'll show some examples with using um, chrome guide and the pin guides that Roe uh, Ro makes for all of us. Uh, but the use of this uh, duplicate denture with a trough to help you at least um, get the configuration of where you need to be with placing that first initial implant because everything is predicated on the trefoil uh, system by the middle by the middle implant of the three uh, implants being placed. So the middle implant goes in first, but you really want to make sure you're going to be within the confines of the ridge and in the right spot. Just a couple quick schematics. Uh, you obviously see on the top. Uh, uh, the top left is the DTX software imaging uh, showing where the trefoil needs to go. This happened to be an edentulous case, a screenshot of that. Uh, this is the template, what we call the, uh, the positioning template of the trefoil. And there's the three points of uh, insertion. And this was what keeps us within the confines of the trefoil bar. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show pictures of the bar in just a moment. But if we're within these three these three points um, of interest. Now, these are not going to be blindly drilled in place, but we're going to have the trefoil kit comes with guides 
already configured to match up to the three points. And if, if we just follow the guide, make sure that the, this is right in midline, then everything falls into place and your bar falls right in the confines of where your implants will eventually be positioned. And every case will have this dimensional positioning. And that's why it's really important to do your planning on the CT scan, uh, knowing what these positions are. So if you don't have software that has the trefoil bar already marked out, you know, we can get the, we can get the, the schematics and get the measurements from Nobel BioCare and they can insert them in any software so you can at least overlay some sort of template on the CT, on your CT planning software so you're in the right confines. So let's go through a case real quickly. This happens to be a patient. She actually has a, she was one of my first all in four cases about 13, 14 years ago. Um, has some repair of her acrylic um, uh, maxillary prost fixed prosthetics. That's why this looks like this. But she now presents with now uh, failing dentition in the anterior mandible, as well as just the non-restorable teeth and, you know, liked the solution. But for her, you know, again, all in four is always an option. She really didn't care so much about the material of choice. So being that she wanted something fixed, wanted acrylic, but couldn't pay for the all on four option. And, you know, I'm not gonna talk, I'm gonna talk in, in terms of generalities, in terms of cost, because this can vary from region to region in our country. In our Cleveland market space area, all on fours can go anywhere from 26 to 28,000, including the final restorative phase. The trefoil is roughly around the, the zone of 14 to 16, $17,000. So significant difference in cost um, because of less appointments, frankly, less amount of workup. There's aren't all the guides that you have to attend with um, and you can deliver the prosthetic uh, the same day. So really it's just follow up care. And as far as chair time, uh, chair side time is concerned. So the, here's an, a, a view of the, um, of the lower arch. And again, I didn't, I failed to mention, but please, uh, please ask your questions in the chat box. And uh, Alan will will field those after my presentation, and we'll answer those as we go. So here's her um, just a panoramic a radiograph showing her upper um, all on four uh, case, but the lower you can see where there's deterioration of the anterior mandible. She's obviously had some long term splinting, some um, long term perio to control this condition, but she's really at the point where she just really wants to do something a little bit more definitive, and so we offer the trefoil system to her. Now, uh, this is a video clip um, that uh, was uh, done with, uh, by Joe using their Blue, Scan, uh, Blue Sky software. And you can see the amount of bone reduction uh, required because if we're measuring out the top of the bone to the opposing arch and may, making sure that the VBO is the same that she presented with, that's the amount of bone to be reduced. And for some people that might be considered a lot, for others it may be uh, okay, but you can see how Joe is measuring this out for us to create a bone reduction guide that will be extremely helpful so we don't have to eyeball and guesstim guesstimate the amount of reduction. Furthermore, what's also very important is that the level of reduction be parallel to the occlusal plane of the trefoil because if we don't reduce enough posteriorly, you'll have a ramping effect of the ridge, which may not give you enough inter arch space the further back you go especially if you're gonna have contact with the, with at least first molar uh, occlusion contact. So very critical on two counts. One is the amount of bone, two is the plane of reduction uh, to aid us um, in creating a nice platform for our trefoil. So again, another video clip uh, showing how, how we plan it using DTX, but you can see that without bone reduction, this bar is sitting on the ridge. Now, of course, this is in software, so I can actually rotate the bar facially, but then, you know, again, I don't have an idea of where the facial uh, platform is gonna go with this software. Uh, you could probably merge in a scan of the proposed um, prosthetic, I'm sure. That can be done. We did not do it for this planning case. So here's some surgical guide sequence of uh, uh, photographs. Um, so again, with the use of the, uh, the, the chrome guided technology and the patented technology using the fixation guide, the pin guide essentially. So this is a tooth borne guide as we all know. This is placed 
on top of the ridge so we know it's, it's seated through through these windows and then we make sure that the the guide is fitting on the contour of the, of the ridge as we typically do when we do our all in four cases very similarly we place our fixation pins and these plunges go in um, that connect uh, the, the superior part of this guide will release the plungers and this comes off. So unlike traditional on four, this is there is no other stackable system uh, used beyond just the placement of the pin guide. This will help to create that foundation platform where we need to remove the bone. And so once this is in place, we extract the teeth. That's the dental alveolar housing. Here's one side trimmed to show you the amount of bone that would be, need to be reduced. And some people might say, but that's quite aggressive, but you have to be in order to create the inner arch uh, space and room uh, for this to work. This is what the kit looks like. It looks quite complex. Actually, when I looked at it the first time, I, I was pretty um, overwhelmed by the number of parts and pieces, but everything is actually very sequentially placed. These are all the different drill sleeves. All these components on top help to put these guides in place. And, and then these are drills that are, just have three markings on them depending on the length of the implant we decide to choose. Um, we have a try-in bar, which is before you actually open up your, guide, your, your actual um, uh, sterile prefabricated um, trefoil bar. You can use a try-in bar and uh, very easily just double and triple check um, that you're in, the, you're in the right place. Finally, um, you'll see that the, just like all Nobel kits have them, you have small, soft, medium, and dense bone. I will tell you the mandible and especially in the anterior where we're placing these implants after reduction, we're always using dense bone and we're always tapping the bone in these cases. The, the trefoil implant also is a, is a specialized implant, so it's not like a Nobel active thread. It is, a, uh, it is like a Nobel Speedy or uh, Branamark uh, Tiunite surface um, uh, in terms of its uh, structure, and it is a parallel walled implant. So this is the, um, uh, another uh, check to verify that we've done the adequate bone reduction, even though we've done this on software. But this is that 22 millimeter guide pin, occlusal guide pin. And this is a patient in a, just a natural um, vertical dimension. Well, of course, she's asleep, so you, you just, you're just seeing if this seems to be vertically uh, appropriate. And I have measured it out using a, uh, using a tongue blade and uh, soft tissue markers to me pre measure the VDO prior to extractions, obviously, while she was awake. And then, of course, we can take that uh, little measuring tool to verify that our vertical dimension is appropriate. This is what it looks like uh, after the amount of bone reduced. And you see it's quite aggressive, so we do have to flop the lingual platform. Your sublingual glands would be sitting right there, and you would uh, suture the mucosa so not to damage or uh, uh, damage the mucosa or any of the lingual structures, which are uh, peripheries of the lingual artery as well. And as you, as you drill through the sequence and place your first implant through the guide, you can see that the amount of density, and this is uh, over 35 newton centimeters, Using this, um, you know, uh, this happens to be a prosthetic, um, a prosthetic uh, uh, torque wrench. But if you were to use uh, the gold um, implant torque wrenches, this would be on, be beyond 75 uh, newton centimeter torquing. And so you, that, you know, you definitely want to be able to have them torque out completely. And once this first implant goes in, all the other implants follow in the same, in the same holes that uh, are already pre-created by. Uh, your initial drill uh, sequences. And so by placing you know, the first implant, which is the most critical one, the latter two can be off buccal or lingually depending on the configuration of the whole uh, of the guide. So you have to be very careful that you are essentially bisecting the ridge with the placement of the implants. The final step is then suture, clo suture and closure. Uh, we'll place these uh, closure caps to suture over top. We will actually take a, an implant uh, uh, index. Um, after you close, you can put on these uh, indices. These are the analogs, um, which then you uh, pick up the position of the implants, which can be slightly off for each patient. So you can't use this in every patient, but there might there might be some variation of a, a two or three three degrees of of uh, implant divergence possibly, and you capture the exact relationship 
um, with just a, just a Durlay resin pattern uh, um, in oper intra intraoperatively then taken to the lab for Joe to then do his uh, mastery. Um, I won't steal his thunder, but uh, he'll show you more details. This is in the lab with the actual bar in place, uh, getting all the components together. This is intraoperatively the same day again, uh, just making sure it's in the right position, getting it. This is a wax, uh, a wax setup of the, uh, of the patient's uh, proposed plan. Once this is verified, a uh, patient then can then be dismissed and come back. Um, or in the last few cases, what we have done is have the patient come back in a couple of weeks. They weren't really that anxious to have their final prosthetic that day, though you can offer that, uh, but they are rather sore and tender if it's a long day because there is time for processing. So when Kevin showed you the um, time clock of surgery, yes, the surgery is very quick. Within an hour and a half, we can be done. There is some of this lab work that then needs to be taken back to the lab to then, uh, uh, then be inserted. So you can do it within six hours if you're very efficient and obviously the proximity of labs and so forth. And that's her at the time of delivery uh, about two weeks later. And you see the, the rapid healing. Um, and of course, she's, she's a happy camper with very minimal, minimal swelling and edema. I'll show one last case and then I'll let Joe take over really quickly. This is an atrophic case, which, you know, as Kevin said, that maybe this trefoil is not uh, indicated for. And granted, as is, this case is not indicated for trefoil because you don't have the amount of native bone to be able to place the minimum uh, length implants, which are 10 millimeters. So in this case, we did some significant grafting. This happens to be um, an approach we did from outside the mouth. Here's the mouth sealed up. This is hip graft with uh, cortical cancellous blocks of hip, hip grafting bone. That's the native mandible, and that's the amount that we doubled in size to create a ridge that would give us a, a now a platform to be able to place the implants. Now, I over bulked the ridge, obviously didn't need that much, but there is gonna be some resorption of the anterior uh, crest um, bone graft harvest that will take place. And uh, I'd rather have more than none or not uh, as much. So again, is another planning clip that you can see. Uh, of the harvested bone, which is not as dense as native bone. That's why it doesn't show up as yellow, but there is definitely bone there as evident on the plan. And you can see with the uh, DTX software, I know exactly where I need to, how much bone I need uh, in this case. Now, uh, we didn't, because she was edentulous, we didn't have um, a guide pin, but Joe was able to help us create a uh, bone reduction guide, which is made out of metal to help uh, reduce the amount of bone. So I, like I said, I had a lot more bone than I actually needed, which is fine. We opened up the area and then placed the reduction guide over top. And then the following sequence of placement of all the implants. And this is some more component photographs to show you uh, that everything is in place. Um, and this is how the rest of the implants are placed, the lateral two implants. Um, this is her with the, at the time of surgery. And this is at the time of delivery. Um, again, two weeks later, midlines are dead on, good occlusal plane, good form and function. And that's all I have for now. So I don't know if there's, uh, Alan, if you want to field any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Joe can uh, go on in. Okay, I am unmuted. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Qureshi and uh, Kevin for uh, giving us your uh, information and your knowledge on uh, the parts and uh, the origins of trefoil and uh, Dr. Qureshi for the uh, nuts and bolts of surgery and the intricacies of uh, getting these cases done. Um, obviously, uh, this, is a, this is a procedure that will be beneficial to uh, a lot of patients, maybe not all patients that, that need lower restorations, but uh, uh, this happens to be something that we've had success with, with the ones we've done. And uh, right now I'm going to take you from the point of Dr. Qureshi getting the implants in uh, and uh, getting the teeth, uh, the bite taken, the teeth set up, try in, and getting the case completed. So uh, as we move with this, what you've seen so far is uh, you've seen this 
config this uh, analogs attached to cylinders in the left picture. And this is a clear resin. You can use anything that works. Uh, I would stay away from anything that shrinks. Uh, you know, light cured composite uh, resin material, uh, Voco or uh, something similar to that uh, works well. It doesn't shrink and put any tension on these two arms that you see uh, uh, right on the left picture that uh, capture the position of the implant pl uh, placements. So we take that, we put analogs on it, and in the middle picture you'll see the uh, p the uh, model that we've made. And you notice it doesn't have soft tissue, it doesn't have any uh, anatomical features, it's just a patty of, of stone that uh, we make that captures the position of the implants. So once we do that, we're ready to go further to the next step. And we wanna get teeth ready for try-in. Now, one thing I'll paraphrase before I forget is that this case, uh, initially and even now sometimes is presented as a one-day procedure. I would, and I don't know this as a fact, but I would venture to guess that 95% of that doesn't happen uh, simply because surgeon's offices uh, or who, the placing doctor's offices are not set up to take a case from start to finish and the chances of a, a, an office being so close to the lab that you could get there fast and get something cure, you know, uh, finished up and ready for insertion the same day is going to be a rare circumstance. So uh, what we've done with Dr. Crushy's cases most of the time is usually within a week, uh, we have the restoration completed and, and ready uh, to uh, put back in the mouth. We try to get them done, you know, in three to four days. Uh, and for the most part, we've been able to do that. And it's still safe to go in and, and put this in the mouth and torque it down into position uh, for delivery. So on the left pictures, you see a teeth set in wax. And this is done in the laboratory. Uh, we, we get a case, we get it mounted, uh, we do a setup, we matrix the setup, uh, and uh, we, we have the position of the teeth in place. So uh, we take that to surgery. And uh, once we get the, the model made uh, that we uh, have, we, we get it mounted. Need help. And, um, okay. Are we okay? Okay. So we mount, we mount the case in the, uh, in the, uh, the surgeon's uh, little laboratory and we get teeth placed in a matrix to the bar. And from there, we can seal those teeth down onto the bar and take the case uh, into the mouth for try-in. That's one way to do it. Uh, so just to repeat, the setups are done in lab, matrixes are made and uh, taken, to the, taken to the articulator that we've uh, made the mounting from uh, chair side after we've taken a bite and uh, seal the teeth to the frame. So as this, these are the steps. Uh, so you'll see that we put the frame in place on the, the model that we've made, uh, the flat uh, non-anatomic model. We'll screw it down. And what makes this work is the fact that uh, these are floating abutment heads. Uh, they are, you know, when you put the screws down through these abutments that you see on the bar, they're loose and, and they have the ability to uh, change direction up to about five degrees or four degrees on each one, meaning that when we screw this down, if there's a little discrepancy of fit between one and the other, this uh, abutment will adapt itself to the top of the uh, implant or the analog that you see here. And uh, once we get everything tightened down, we take some acrylic, and you'll see that in the, in the second picture from the top left, and we fuse that position to the frame uh, so that nothing can move. Uh, there's also an alternative way to do that, but we have to do it in the laboratory, and that would be to uh, take that, bring it to the lab, get everything mounted up and ready, remove the acrylic from the bar as you see it, and we would take take everything to a laser welder and and tack the you know the the abutments to the bar uh, with laser welding. Uh, we haven't really seen a need to do that at this point. We don't, I haven't, at least I don't know of any 
issues we've had with those, anything coming apart. So uh, we'll probably continue with the acrylic method unless uh, somebody, you know, we get a request to have these laser welded. So uh, the next step uh, after that is we take this to the mouth. We get a bite uh, onto the bar, as you can see in the top right picture. And uh, we'll take that to the mouth and we're gonna start on the bottom left. We will register a centric. Uh, we'll capture that position. Uh, and you will also see that we take an impression, uh, take impression material and squirt under uh, the, uh, the uh, bar itself and around the border so that we can capture the new tissue position. And remember at this point, uh, everything is sutured up. So the tissue position we captured is gonna be one that we can put an appliance against. Uh, and we take that and we go to the model that we've made earlier and uh, we, we screw that down and make sure that we secure that soft tissue piece uh, to the model and we remount it. And uh, from that remounting that you see on the articulator, we take that and we can put the teeth in the matrix that we've made in the lab with the setup and wax the teeth to the framework uh, for a try-in. And that's one method uh, to do this. And that method works. Uh, we used a method with Dr. Kreshi's cases that I think is probably uh, a little quicker uh, as far as a chair side uh, goes and laboratory work, you know, in the office the day of surgery. And the next uh, slide is gonna show that. Uh, we can make um, a, a clear matrix or a clear appliance uh, with teeth in it uh, that fit around the bar and into the mouth so that the patient can bite down onto that. Uh, that you know, there will be some uh, wax holding it in place. It can bite into it and we can actually move that around into the centric position and confirm the bite. Uh, at that point uh, for the try-in. Now, this shows a clear uh, uh, acrylic uh, duplication of the setup. What, what, we, what we did on the last case was I made a, a duplicate of the occlusal surfaces of the, the tooth setup a, a, into an arch form that was maybe three millimeters thick. And we took the bite in wax. And once we got to the mouth, I oriented that arch of teeth on the soft wax and, and the, had the patient bite into position. And while the wax was soft, we, we just moved the, uh, that uh, tooth set up in, that's in one block form into occlusion with the patient, uh, upper teeth, and confirmed that the centric was good by being able to repeat the bite numerous times and uh, be sure that uh, uh, the bite was good. And we had her sitting up erect for this instead of in a supine position, which it's probably a more accurate way to, to confirm the bite. Uh, so once we got that completed, the, the, the procedure for the day, as far as the patient is concerned, and Dr. Kreshi is, is done. So we can dismiss the patient at that point, after we'll take the bar out, the setup out, and uh, the patient can uh, leave. Now at that point, you're gonna have uh, three implants uh, protruding through the tissue, through the gums, and with no protection around it. And so what we do is, uh, or what Dr. Qureshi will do, is take something like um, uh, a tissue moulage, and he will inject that around those implants pretty much just about up to the top of the, uh, the uh, healing collars and around the implants so that uh, you know, we, we protect the sutures that are there and the patient doesn't have three posts in their mouth that can be irritating. Uh, to the tongue. So we protect the tissue and also make this a little more comfortable for the patient to tolerate until they get their final appliance in place. So once we take it back to the lab, we will go through our normal uh, setup or our normal uh, finishing procedure that we would use for all on four type cases, hybrid cases, uh, you know, the waxing up of it, the processing, and uh, we send it back to the lab and it will look just exactly like you see here. Now, Dr. Qureshi mentioned earlier uh, when he was doing his uh, surgical uh, part of the pr uh, program that at, up to this point, we've used denture teeth and an, an acrylic wrap. So that's not to say that someday we can't use a zirconia. We have ways to 
design zirconia over a bar like this that can be cemented into place on the bar, an acrylic uh, tissue or composite uh, be applied to, to give us our tissue thickness and, and tissue design uh, that, uh, that, you know, I, I foresee sometime in the future, somebody's gonna try it and do it and maybe us. Uh, we also have nano ceramics, our crystal ultra material that we can design to fit over this bar and cement into place, bond into place on the bar and surround that with uh, a wax up of acrylic and inject it uh, for the tissue part of the appliance. So I think going forward, those things will happen. Uh, uh, and uh, it will, you know, you have more than one choice for materials on these kind of cases and a choice that is gonna be uh, maybe better in some respects as far as uh, just maintenance is concerned, or teeth popping out or breaking, uh, you know, long-term wearing capacity better than denture teeth. So um, that's something that I think that uh, is uh, in the future here. And I think that is the, the last slide that I have. Uh, yes, and, and so this is the end of uh, my presentation uh, here. And at this point, I think we are ready to uh, answer questions on any of the information from all three of us that was provided. And uh, whoever, uh, are you gonna organize the questions? Alan's gonna organize the questions and everybody, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Qureshi and Kevin, uh, turn turn your speakers on, and uh, we can go through this now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Kevin. That was terrific. There's, um, if, if anyone has uh, done an, done a, a, any research on this, they always have questions because it's such an interesting, unique process. So thank you for taking us through that. A uh, little little bit limited on questions. In fact. We just have we just have one question that was texted over, and that was something we talked to all together about before the program, and that is, are you able to guide the middle implant uh, when you go to place a virtual implant? Select the trifoil dental. It was, a, it was like a software economics question. Um, well, okay, so there's two questions. One is, can you guide the middle implant? And uh, we. I guess we all kind of talk. I can I can kind of summarize that there is no uh, there is no methodology at this point for guiding the implant. In fact, trefoil is really designed for uh, sort of a, a freehand mechanism of placing that middle implant, but still controlled as far as the pre-manufactured bar. Uh, if if someone really wanted to have that middle implant um, guided, we could probably do it in Nobel Clinician. If you run to do this in conjunction with Chrome, uh, uh, Kevin and Roe could probably find a way to get the X STL files, the offset, and guide that first um, drill. And perhaps it would be just to make an osteotomy and then, and then freehand the implant. We'd have to look into that, the way the mechanics of how that would work. It might be possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far, as far as having the middle implant guided, to be honest with you, so you, you, the Trefoil, you know, kit that they showed uh, comes with the guides to actually create the implant osteotomy site. All you're doing is you're picking the midpoint. So if the question is, how do we pick the exact midpoint? Um, that's, that's an eyeball. We're using the positioning template and there was a radiograph that I showed uh, it was a CT scan, actually, of the positioning template with the three holes in it, and it's just a flat, plain template that sits over the bone, which can rotate. So there is a position, but I suppose you could engineer something, and I don't know if it's if it's necessary, frankly, to do that, to actually engineer something that would strap on the bone itself to have a bone uh, bone bearing um, stent for the those three sites just to make sure that you're going to be in the midpoint so that there's no rotational change as you go forward that could be i think that could be made uh joe with your software yeah we would just the, the thing that makes this critical is uh we we have to get the stls for the parts and we have to make sure that the scale from the stl matches the scale of of the bone in the software and if the scale matches and we're able to do it. 
And that's something we have to do just by testing it uh, on some uh, models and uh, seeing how accurate that really is uh, in conjunction with, with your kit, Dr. Kreshi. Uh, I will say though that uh, along with the midline uh, position of the, uh, of the uh, first implant, uh, what really, in my opinion, is, is one of the very big keys to this is keeping the, uh, the, the bone platform level with the occlusal plane and using that uh, bone reduction guide as a way to achieve that, uh, you know, it just makes it easier than to use your eyes for that. You have something that uh, you can take a burr and follow the flat surface of the bone reduction guide. And also, uh, you'll know if you don't have bone uh, taken down to the top of the reduction guide because early on we didn't use those and Sometimes we would end up, uh, and I'm sure other people around the country have found this too, where in the posterior, you didn't have enough room uh, for the bar and, the, and acrylic, so we had to adjust the bar at that point to, to make the space. And everything worked out. We didn't have to adjust the bar uh, enough to cause any weakness, but uh, that the bone reduction guide, I think, is a major help uh, in getting these things done accurately. Would you agree, Dr. Koreshti? Right. So, and, you know, and I, I also committed the same mistake that when you have your patient in the supine position, they're asleep for us. And so your hand tends to, to reduce the bone aggressively anteriorly, and you don't bring the posterior down enough. And that's what I tried to show um, on, on the DTX software that if you don't reduce it, you're just going to have your bar uh, and, the, and, and your prosthetic really uh, up against the top of the bony ridge posteriorly. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question here, and I don't know if Alan, you set this question, is, is AP reduction, is AP spread an issue? I don't know, I'm not sure that was a question that you posed. Well, I think it was, it was text in to us, so we posted it, yes. Yeah, so, go ahead, I don't know, Joe, you want to um, talk about Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, this, this, know, sure. yeah this system was engineered for the uh, length of the bar and the AP spread to work. Uh, if, if you're going to do a trefoil with the spread that this has, where, they, where, they, where this is positioned and the length of the bar, the teeth shouldn't go beyond the length of the bar uh, because that would probably violate the AP spread. But given the engineering and the science that went into this, the length of the implants, the design of the implants, all of those things have been taken into account and the AP spread is just fine with this technique. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, there's there's a, a question about economics here, maybe uh, for for Kevin, and that is if you compare the costs of um, of, of performing an all-on-four surgery, the components, right, the number of implants, the number of abutments, the number of normal part normal parts and pieces for an all-on-four day of surgery, compared to uh, compared to trefoil, keeping in mind that trefoil for that few days is a final. We're all on four. There's, you know, there are more, some more costs down the road. Sure. So the surgical kit, um, I see in the question, a ballpark on the surgical kit, ballpark 5,000. Um, in terms of what, you know, if you look at this between maybe what the specialist would pay versus what the general, general dentist would pay. So I would, the three implants and the healing abutments, the surgeon would purchase for approximately $1,000. The trefoil bar would be purchased by the general dentist and that's approximately 1,500. These are just approximates. So if you add up the components for a trefoil case, it's about 2,500 and that does not include the surgical kit. Then you have your lab bill. So, Joe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. And and for us, the, the lab bill, it's going to be, I, I believe, Joe, a little bit more for uh, for a trefoil setup and processing and so forth than it would be just for an immediate denture uh, for day of conversion. Well, it would be the same cost as, if, you know, for our, we have a, and I don't know right off the top of my head, that section of the pricing, uh, it would be the same price as if, you know, for doing uh, the process, just for the finishing of it. Uh, as we would charge for any hybrid case. Uh, but the, okay. there is going to be a fee for the setup 
and the uh, you know the you know the chair side work that we do, uh, you know the day of surgery too. So, um, Alan, uh, we have that somewhere. I'm sure that we could we could uh, let people know if they you know by email if they want to. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, there's a question here about. Uh, about you know about using Chrome again. I think just to kind of summarize that the the issue with using Chrome and the, and our rapid appliance and our real you know the predictable process we have for loading a prosthetic and for making a duplicate of it. The issue is that is that at at Row we create everything, right? We create the prosthetic, the surgical guide. We create everything. But with Trifoil, there's pre-manufactured components, and those are not in our software. And so we, we've done a little bit of R&D with um, a pre-manufacturing a prosthetic for, for Trifoil. But frankly, um, that system has been worked out and, it's, and it works. It's a system. It's probably not uh, going to be in our wheelhouse for, wheelhouse for a while to, to, to load the prosthetic, do the full design, and, you know, and do that and, and, and replace the whole product of... of um, Trifoil. I think it's better to use the two in concert, one for bone reduction and then one for implant placement and, uh, and bar uh, mm -hmm. insertion. I think it's better to work out the two together. Well, I agree. Yeah. And especially if we're trying to introduce this particular uh, treatment option as an economical solution, we're not trying to build in more costs and make it more fancy as it is. That's why all the guides to place these three implants in the exact spot are already in the kit that are used over and over and over again. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, that is, that's all the questions. So once again, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. I think we'll probably announce a couple more.